So welcome to our class on community with the Corinthians. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. You can move to the next slide whenever you're ready. Welcome, come on in, friends. We're so glad you're here. Uh, for those who are just joining, I've, I've already said this, so sorry to repeat myself, but this is our very first ever experiment with hybrid learning. And so um, we've got a Zoom call that is going and at least one participant who is joining us on the Zoom call. And when the PowerPoint's not going, you'll be able to see the sort of Brady Bunch of squares. That's to help remind you that there are others here. So if you have a question, we're gonna try to remember up here to repeat that so into the microphone so everyone can hear it. Um, and we'll just see how this goes. Well, shall we start? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please come on in. There are a few extra seats over here, and there are several in the front row that I know nobody wants to sit in, but they are available. <laughs> All right. So if we move forward in our slides, I wonder how familiar you might be with Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And so I pulled out some verses or passages that I thought you might know. Um, so, Father Casey, if you'll bring that first one in. Anybody know this one? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Anybody know that one? I see a few heads nodding. We read that in Epiphany in your B. Um, all right, let's go on to the next one. How about this one, a new creation? If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That sounds familiar. If you pray noon prayer very often, that's one of the options to read there. And then of course, there's this one. I think you might have to play, there we go. Oh. Can you hear it? It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. You probably guess. Only angered and keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil or rejoices in evil. Let's start it over. Okay. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil or rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You know that one, right? That's an actual wedding video I found on YouTube and um, borrowed it um, to make a point, but I just love that. I read an article this week in which the author said, if Paul, if we compare Paul to a movie maker, then the average reader is like somebody who sees the trailer and thinks they know the movie. Someone who sees only the highlights. Because we read snippets of these extraordinary letters on occasional Sundays, but many of us never read them all the way through. Has anyone ever read one or both letters all the way through? A handful. If you've taken a disciple Bible class, for example, or, 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 or gone to study. Well, it's too bad that most of us haven't because 
These two letters show us more about Paul and about early Christian community among the Gentiles than maybe any other writing we have. And they have a lot to teach us as we emerge from pandemic about Christian community. And so that's why we thought they would be wonderful to read together. Paul was an unlikely Christian. If you've, uh, if you've read much of the Bible, you've seen some of these passages that Paul says, if anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. So proud. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, this is breathtaking, blameless. I mean, only Paul would attempt to say that, right? An unlikely Christian. And then, of course, I pulled out a passage from Acts showing how Paul, before he was Paul, when he was Saul, was a persecutor of the church. And he was zealous for persecuting these Christians who he saw as violating his, the, the Jewish uh, roots that he had. So let's move forward, and I'll tell you this. The Corinthians themselves, they were unlikely Christians as well. And before we get going, let's just dive a little bit into the city of Corinth and what was going on there. At the time of Paul's first visit to Corinth and the time of the letters that he wrote, we think Corinth was the capital or the leading Greek city. Its historical rival, Athens, at that point you see right nearby, had been destroyed, it had declined. And so that left Corinth as, um, as the capital city for that area, it was the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. And it was situated on this narrow isthmus, you see that between um, east and west. So it was a gateway kind of a city. It was multicultural, it was multi-ethnic, it was multilingual, it was multi-religious. Anybody live in a place like that? <laughs> it had, Corinth had all of the best and the worst of a vital, throbbing, pagan city. Now, in Greek ideals, in Greek thought, there was, a lot of, there was a lot to challenge people spiritually and culturally, and Greek thought was strong in the city of Corinth. Greeks customarily scorned all things physical, and that gave rise, ironically, to both hedonism and stoicism, and that line of thought was alive and well at the time Paul showed up. And finally, Corinth's reputation for licentiousness was well known. Uh, one commentator I read this week said that religious syncretism in Corinth provided a melting pot for Jewish, Roman, and Greek practices that tended to boil down the precious and leave a residue of counterfeit alloys. The fact that it was such a melting point tended to boil down the precious, leaving behind counterfeit alloys. Anybody live in a place like that? <laughs> Sometimes I think that's, that's still true today. There's some speculation that Paul was not the first Christian ever to set foot in Corinth. Some believe there was a small group already there when he arrived. They cite his ready lodging and work with Priscilla and Aquila pictured here, who became leaders in the church when Paul got there and after he left, continued his work by assisting Apollos and helping him to grow into his faith. This is just a, excuse me, a snippet from Acts, where it says that after um, Paul had, had been working, he left Athens and he went to Corinth. And this is the first time he went. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered the Jews to leave Rome. And so Paul went and worked with them. So it's, it's not clear that they were already Christian by the time they got there, but it's possible. Either way, Paul had his work cut out for him when he sought to grow this small group of Christians into a community united under Christ. He spent a total of 18 months in Corinth, we believe, 
though from the way his first letter reads, it's not clear how much progress he made with them. So we'll get into this letter in which he has to, has to give them some more support and help. So what was Paul up to? Why was he writing? The text of this first letter gives us some clues. So let's bring in the first clue. He says in chapter one, verse 11, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. So uh, in, in Paul's time, you, you may know that Christians met in houses. They didn't have lovely buildings like this one. And they were usually owned by the wealthier members of a community, those who could afford homes that had plenty of space for people to gather. So Chloe is likely a financially independent woman. She's not described in connection with any male head of household, which would have been uh, more to the point. He would have said, you know, I've heard from Chloe's husband's people, for example, if she had been married. Uh, so Chloe sends word to Paul that there are problems in the community, and he responds by writing this letter. Now, before we go on, I think it's worth saying, Paul gets a lot of uh, bad press for his views of women. And yet here, in this letter that he's writing to the Corinthians, he's saying, I heard from a leader among you, a, a woman, that there's, there are problems, and I'm writing to address them. There's no uh, he doesn't seem to have any problems with the fact that she is a leader in that community. In fact, it sounds very much as though he appreciates her leadership and her making him aware of problems that he needed to address. So it's worth pointing out at the beginning. All right, let's see the next one. We've got all these passages. The first one is in 7.1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it seems that the Corinthians themselves had written to Paul with a host of questions that gave rise to this letter. And throughout the letter, we're gonna see Paul say, now concerning, now concerning. So for example, now concerning virgins, now concerning food sacrificed at idols, now concerning spiritual gifts, or concerning the collection for the saints. Every time you read that as we go through the letter, you can understand Paul is moving from one point to another that the Corinthians themselves has, have likely reached out to him with some questions. So he's answering those questions. All right, one more. Paul says near the end of the letter, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus, Fortunatus and Acacius because they have made up for your absence. They've refreshed my spirit as well as yours, give recognition to such people. So these folks have come from Corinth to be with Paul, to talk personally with him, most likely about some troubles in the church. Roman ro roads would have made this travel very uh, easy, very simple. Well, maybe not easy, but possible anyway. Um, their visit would likely have signaled to Paul that things were not um, perfect in paradise back home. So we have three reasons Paul writes. And so I, I cluster this together to say we have three very clear reasons that Paul is writing to these folks. It is an occasional letter. He has occasion to write to them. He writes to a particular group with particular concerns in order to address those concerns. He isn't setting out to write a comprehensive systematic theology, and that's important to know before we jump into reading it. He's not like Mark who sets out to tell a whole story and to make theological meaning of Jesus' life. It's important to understand he wasn't in his own mind writing scripture. I wonder if Paul had any clue whatsoever that we would be sitting in this room now, pouring through his letter and trying to understand more about who God is and who we are and how to live in community together. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have that understanding, right? Somebody on, later on after seeing the letter thought, oh, there's richness here. We should preserve it. We should hand it down. Okay, so going on to our next slide, maybe that explains Paul's leadership style in the letter. He says to them, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. He is frustrated. He uses a lot of irony here that borders on sort of sarcasm from time to time. 
They say they, they follow him, but he thanks God. He didn't baptize them because he wants them to follow Christ. Okay, let's look at another one. For as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? I want you to understand. Remember I said that in Greek thought, spiritual aspects of our lives were, were given higher priority and physical were thought of as low or base. So for Paul to say to them, when you do this, you're acting fleshy, you're acting human is an insult. He doesn't agree with it. He doesn't agree with that ideology, but he doesn't mind getting in their face, right? One more about his style. He says, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Quite apart from us, you have become kings. I wish that you had become kings so that we might become kings with you. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles last of all, as though sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and mortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Frustrated that their sights are not set on the right goals, Paul scolds them, already you have all you want. They're ranking one another based on spiritual leaders, and we'll see that as we get into the letter, but he mocks them. I don't know. If Paul were standing here today, I wonder if he'd be holding his head in his hands, a little embarrassed about the letter he sent, right? So it's important to keep that in mind. It is an occasional letter written for a particular occasion. It doesn't mean we can't learn from it just means it wasn't written with a view toward addressing all of you necessarily, but maybe sometimes it will address us. We'll see. All right, let's talk about the structure of this letter to the Corinthians. Paul followed conventions of his day when he wrote, and actually we can identify which letters we think were authentically Paul's and which letters seem to have been written by followers of Paul, people who wanted to adopt his style, but maybe didn't follow his conventions. So um, let's see, I don't think I have any youth in here. They're all in their own room. So it won't come as any surprise to you when I say that when we set out to communicate with someone in writing, um, we follow certain conventions, right? Um, letters, emails, even texts, there are, um, there are certain conventions we follow, like a salutation. Um, you know, when we write to someone, we begin with a salutation and a greeting. Dear Casey, I hope you and your family are well. Or in the case of a text, maybe, hey, how are you? <laughs> right? R and you, even that is a salutation. Um, and if we think the person uh, may not have our phone number in their contacts, it's helpful if we say something like, BTW, this is Rebecca, right? By the way, this is Rebecca. And Paul's salutations are like that, right? He identifies himself. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. And then he identifies who he's writing to, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with those in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And finally, he wishes them well. Uh, here's the, I hope you and your family are well, right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's now gonna move on to a Thanksgiving section. And we've fallen out of the convention of including Thanksgiving sections in our correspondence, but we might do well to go back to that because it's really quite lovely. Eucharisto, I always give thanks to my God for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you've been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you are called into the fellowship 
of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Isn't that lovely? I mean, can you imagine opening up a letter and having someone say, I give thanks to God for you every day because of your faith. And God has blessed you and God is faithful to the end and he will continue to strengthen. I mean, wow, I need that. I would love that letter every day to show up on my doorstep. And, and notice that he's signaling in this Eucharisto, in this Thanksgiving portion of the letter, some of the things he's going to talk about in the communication. He says, you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as it, as it turns out, and you'll, you'll find as we proceed, the Corinthians are fighting amongst themselves about which, which spiritual gifts that certain people have are better than others, right? They're, that, they're, they're elevating some. And so he's getting ready to admonish them because they've been using their giftedness for the building up of their own egos and not for the benefit of others, right? He says, um, in every way, where am, I, where am I? In every way, you have been enriched in him, in Jesus, right? In speech and knowledge of every kind. Paul is going to jump into this later in chapter one because they're using not just their spiritual giftedness to rank one another, but also their knowledge. Some are claiming to have special knowledge they've gained from certain teachers, and they're using their knowledge not to enlighten and improve the community, but again, to build themselves up. Later on in chapter eight, he'll say, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. All right, next section of the letter is the body. And I'm not gonna to try to teach the whole class today. So we've got lots of weeks to get into that, stay tuned. And then, um, then generally at the end, there's a conclusion. So I gave you a spoiler alert. If you don't like to hear the end of the, the letter at the beginning of the class, you can plug your ears. Paul says, keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. The churches of Asia sends greetings, Aquila and Pris Priscilla, I've left out a letter together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. All the brothers and sisters send greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. It would have been very customary for him to use a scribe, and he wants them to understand how important the content of his letter has been. So he sort of takes the pen and says, I'm writing this myself. This is really important to me. Let anyone be accursed who has no love for the Lord. Our Lord come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. May my love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. That's the structure of the letter. Questions so far? Let me just pause before we go on. I'm feeling a little pressed for time because I know we got in here kind of late. All right. So um, Father Ted sent me this before, uh, before we, we got started. He sent it to me this past week and I thought it was sort of funny. And you'll, you'll maybe find it funny as you begin to read along with us in the letter. Things Paul knew when he first came to Corinth. Um, Jesus Christ crucified and directions to Corinth, just this little bitty piece. And uh, Father Casey, if you'll just click forward. Paul says to them, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not strictly speaking accurate. By the time Paul arrived in Corinth, he was actually a pretty experienced church planter. He had already started churches in Galatia and Philippi and Thessalonica. But it is kind of funny, given what Jesus says, that, or given what Paul says, that he, he decided to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ crucified. Because what Paul really does in this letter is expound to his audience what he calls the logic of the cross. Now in your translations, it might be translated the wisdom of the cross, but the word in Greek is logos, which is the word for logic. And Paul contrasts the logic of the cross with the logic of the world, the logic of Greek tradition in many, many ways. Christ crucified is a theme throughout the letter and he instructs them in Christian community living following Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. 
we know, right? It's hard to live together with others in community of love. And to do this, Paul tells the Corinthians that they must adopt this logic of the cross and turn away from the logic of the world around them. So my New Testament professor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Clark Souls, who's gonna join us for a couple of our sessions together, uh, has written a book on 1 Corinthians. And in it, she says, what's at stake for Paul when he's talking with the Corinthians and as it relates to all of us, is that we must live with intention we must live on purpose, logically, not with just any intention or purpose or logic, but with that which derives from the values that are on display in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. That's the logic of love, the logic of the cross, of reconciliation with God and one another and all of creation. So the logic of the cross is going to dominate a lot of our conversations. We journey together through these letters. We're going to explore what it looks like to adopt the logic of the cross. And Paul's going to apply that to practical situations. So a couple things to watch out for before we go on. Paul presents the cross as a paradigm of power. Now we take that for granted because we've heard little snippets that claim, proclaim that to us here and there. But it's really quite ironic. And that is a stumbling block for Corinthians, for many of them, because an instrument of cruel torture and death is a symbol of power. But to them, it's a symbol of the power of those who wield that instrument of the Roman Empire. That's the logic of the world, Paul says. The cross shows Jesus' power and Caesar's weakness. And they've got to get their minds around that. They've got to wrap their heads around. This is not about Caesar's power and Jesus' weakness, which was what it looked like. He also says the cross contrasts and redefines altogether wisdom and foolishness. So there's going to be a lot of talk in the letter about what is wisdom? And how is it that the cross makes us foolish in a good way? And finally, Paul is going to teach them that the cross is the central point of unity for all Christians. It provides our identity, which is a shared identity with one another. We are all people who follow, who benefit from, who try to live as this one who was crucified on the cross. And it dictates our morality. Where Christians submit to that symbol of unity, love and fellowship will prevail. That's what chapter 13 is all about, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not envious or boastful. That's the logic of the cross. It's not the logic of the world. And it's really pretty when we watch the lake video and they're standing up there and they're saying all these things. But what they're really saying is, I will lay down my life for you. I want the logic of the cross to govern our wedded life together. A little different from the sort of beautiful music and birds and lake and everything, right? It's, it's saying something very countercultural. All right, take a breath. Questions, comments? Anybody on the chat? Can you even see the chat? Anything coming up? Okay, great. Well, let's, um, let's move forward and let's try to understand what's the problem in Corinth? What's going on? What's Paul so upset about? Here, this map is going to be your guide to North Shore. Now, where you sit in the cafeteria is crucial because you got everybody there. You got your freshmen, ROTC guys, preps, JV jocks, these nerds, who varsity jocks, unfriendly black bodies, girls who eat their feelings, girls who don't eat anything, desperate wannabes, burnout. Sexually active bandies, the greatest people you will ever meet, and the worst. Beware of the plastic. Show of hands, have you seen Mean Girls? 
Oh, that's a great film. It's one of our favorites at our house, right? Um, really, when you begin to read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you're going to see they are acting like junior high cliques. They're, they're, they're acting like they're, they're um, everything wins, succeeds, or fails based on who you're following on Instagram at the moment, based on what fashion trends you're catching up with, right? And so Paul, essentially in the first three chapters, writes to them and says, if we move forward, you know, like, can't you just all get along? Which is kind of, I mean, spoiler alert, but that's kind of what happens at the end of Mean Girls too, right? He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Here's that statement about Chloe. It has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one you can say you were baptized in my name. And here you can tell Paul's really agitated because he has been thinking about that as he writes it. And he's like, oh wait, I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. I mean, just really get to see Paul and who he is and how his mind works here, right? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom. So the cross of Christ might not be emptied. Of its power. One um, commentator I read this week suggested that the problem with the Corinthians was that they'd been raised on this diet of dichotomies, whereas Jews had a holistic understanding of humanity that treated the whole human person from the viewpoint of the body or could treat the whole human person from the viewpoint of the soul but either could express the whole person. For Greeks, body and soul were separate, and the spiritual person is higher than superior to the physical person, the body, right? We kind of covered that a little bit. But the commentator was saying this separation of people into spiritual equals good and physical equals bad easily led them to create and tolerate dichotomies between beliefs and conduct. And it allowed them to divide themselves as they were doing based on any number of characteristics. So listen to the way that the Corinthians divided themselves into cliques or groups or factions and think about your life today and the lives of people we know and love. They divided themselves based on alliance to different ministers or leaders you might say different denominations. They divided themselves based on who lived a celibate or a married life. They divided themselves based on dietary practices, who ate meat and who was gluten-free. Not really, but something like that. Uh, they divided themselves based on income level, the poor and the rich, and the rich were better in Greek thought, right? They divided themselves based on who had what spiritual gift. I wonder if that triggers any thoughts for you or activates any thoughts for you about how we divide ourselves today. Anybody have any ideas? Politically, Democrat or Republican or other, <laughs> right? Yeah. Vaxxed and anti-vaxxed, mask wearers and non-mask wearers. There's always one that's better in these equations, right? Although we don't all share the same idea of what's better and what's not. Yeah. Paul writes to the Corinthians to teach them that these divisions among each other 
and ultimately of themselves into body and soul are inconsistent with that logic of the cross we've been talking about. That's a model of limitless mutual charity. And it's the measure, Paul says, of authenticity and way of life. He's clear about these divisions right here from the start, pitting one apostle or leader against another and declaring allegiance to one and not to the other. That's idolatry, he says. These leaders aren't God. They aren't Christ into whom the Corinthians have been baptized. Questions, thoughts, concerns, comments? Okay. So let's move forward. Until I've been urgent since I thought we were starting late because I'm because I'm kind of at my last slide here about where we're gonna go from here in our reading. What we have been talking about today, this setup of the divisions among the Corinthians, their tendency to follow the logic of the world instead of the logic of the cross, their inability to understand the unity that Christians are called to share with one another, the infighting, the clickiness, all of this comes from the first three chapters of Paul's letter. And so if you have a chance sometime this afternoon or early this week, sit down with that first letter to the Corinthians and read those first three chapters. And you might even get a, a pad and a pen or take notes in your Bible. If you're writing the Bible kind of a person, we could divide ourselves that way too, couldn't we, right? Like people who write in their Bible and people who don't. <laughs> And I don't, so please don't write in my Bible, but you understand my point. Take some notes and see if you can see these themes coming up, if you can find these problems being presented and how you see Paul responding to them from the beginning. So that's kind of where we've been. Next week, Father Casey will come in and he will talk about all kinds of factors that complicate our relationships. He's going to be focusing, I'll give you a little clue, on sort of chapters five through seven is what we have in mind. And so... If you want to do a little work ahead, maybe toward the end of the week, before you come in next week, taking a look at chapters five through seven might be really, really helpful for you. Yes? All right. Questions? I hear there are two kinds of people. Yes. The kinds of people who split people into two kinds of people. <laughs> right. Right. Sorry. Most of us fall into the first category, though, right? <laughs> uh, this is going to be a splendid class. Thank you. I, I think the 13th chapter of the first letter is the seminal. Uh, I always thought it was sort of the iconic scripture for weddings, and only recently have. Uh, have a reveal that it's a smackdown, a, a vicious indictment by all of the uh, uh, misanthropy and the divisiveness and the hatefulness that he, he, he is uh, not semi politely, pretty sarcastically. Uh, uh, putting down in this chapter about love. There, there's this binary view of the world, Father Casey, but there is a transcendent cosmic principle. Yes. Which uh, should, uh, which we all need to learn and observe and practice. And it, it is the great minimalizer. It shows how unimportant almost all of our opinions and divisions and, and pettiness in life really is. Mm -hmm. It's about kindness, as Father Casey says in his sermon this morning, but it is about the cosmic incarnate kindness of Christ. Well said. 
I mean, we, we read chapter 13 at wedding. I mean, it's like you get to a wedding and they start reading and you think, oh, this again, I can tune out. I know this one, right? And we do, we think it sounds so much like that little video, but it's really like the time when your mom walks in and finds that you have intentionally destroyed your baby sister or brother's favorite Lego creation just for the spite of it and is standing there over you screaming, this is not how we love each other. Love is patient and kind, and it's not jealous or boastful, and it's not arrogant or rude. I mean, it, there is a very much a sense that Paul is, is fired up through the whole letter. It's very unlikely that in the middle of it, he took a deep breath and calmed down for a moment enough to say, you know, love is patient and kind, you know, and the violin soaring in the background. It's, it's not, not, I'm not like that. Does that mean that pulling it out of that context and reading it at a wedding is not appropriate? No, right? Um, there is a tenacity to the love that's described in that, in that chapter. And it's a brilliant model for how two people who are joining their lives together in holy matrimony ought to be guiding themselves, but it's not sentimental. It's, it's about the hard work of love. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts or reflections as we, we come to a conclusion here. All right. I hope you all have a Bible at home. If not, you can find Bibles online very easily. I'm not going to tell you which translation to use. Use more than one. Read the print version you have. And then if you don't have a different print version, get online and read it. Read these passages in another translation. Um, and you'll begin to get a sense for the depth and the richness of the text. Because everything we have now is a translation, right? And so everybody's going to translate things differently. So thank you all so much for coming. Friends on our Zoom call, I hope that you were able to hear and participate fully. I can't see your comments as we're doing our PowerPoints here, but we'll take a look that that Zoom chat will save for us. And if you've got questions that you've posted there or want to post there now, we will bring them up and address them. For all of you, if you're unable to be here with us, the Zoom information was sent to you as part of your registration. It will not change week to week. So if you have a week when you're traveling, you're sick, you're not able to be here, just dial in on Zoom. And finally, the Zoom is being recorded. So if you have a week when you're just completely out of pocket and you can't participate live, we'll upload those recordings to the church's webpage. That usually happens Tuesday or Wednesday in the week. So don't email me Monday saying you can't find it because I'll say, of course you can't. Um, but we're so glad that you're joining this process with us. I hope that we find a renewed sense of community and commitment to building community in our lives as a result. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Mm -hmm.